Masters. Uh, well, see, well, see, see, you what are on second place. place. Uh, well, it's the Masters. You have to watch the Masters. Well, you don't have to. You kind of do. I do. Right. So what are you trying For to say? For me, as a golfer, it is important. Though. You're a golfer? Yeah. Wow. You golf? I golf. Wow. Yeah, yeah he, yeah. Built a, he built the Wayne County Country Club. I feel kind of lied to. I feel like that is a part of your life that you, like, hid. Are you ashamed to be a golfer? No. No. Oh, no. Me and Shane talk about golf. We used to talk about golf a lot. That's yeah. why you guys are besties for the resties. Yeah, Shane, maybe. What? Shane, what? Besties for the resties. At practice, they'd always be over there by themselves, like whispering and conversating. And we'd be talking about our golf games usually. You guys probably thought we were talking about something else, but usually we were talking about golf. No, I thought you guys were talking about whatever it is you talk about. <laughs> Honestly, I thought you guys might be talking about Larry Bird because Shane is obsessed with him. <laughs> He does love Lady Bird. <laughs> All right, so today we're finally getting to World War II. It's taken us the entire year, but we are finally getting there. What else do we have after this? Um, Oops, after World War II, we still got a lot to cover this year. We've got the Cold War, we've got Vietnam, we've got civil rights. We've got <gasps> we better get to civil rights. Thirty four days. Yeah, so. we better we get to civil rights. Well, we'll get through World War II pretty quick because oh. we've got about 40 oh my days gosh, or we something. Notes? We've got 34 days 34 after days. today, I think. Yep, uh, you've got oh. a KWL chart, which we've not taken notes like this before, so I kind of wanted to switch up the way that we took notes because the way we were doing something different. Um, but you've got three columns here. One is where you're going to put things that you know, so it's even if... It's kind of like that a little bit. Not exactly like a brew too. But it's a little different because we're writing a lot more than three years here in one. So on this, in this column, you're just writing things that you already know. So as we move through the lecture, if you already know that thing, you just put it under the no category. If, it, if you come across any questions that you still have, you put it in the wonder part in the middle. And then on the right, you put things that you didn't know already or that oh, you learned. This is going to take so long. Course, so if you don't take that long. You don't so have to write everything. How many? Not, how many? Oh, so we don't like start right now and say what we already know. No I mean, you can go ahead and start. Go ahead and actually take a second and think about some of the things that you already know about World War II, whether you know them from mm -hmm. movies that you've watched or if you've already studied a little bit about World War II. I've read them. Just or some. Yeah, if you've read a book or something. How many books have you read on World War II? Well, I read them on the Holocaust. Okay, we'll see if you know something about the Holocaust already. That can go in the no zero two. Okay. I went to the Holocaust Museum. That's a place I'd really I like to visit sometime. Yeah, I didn't know what was going on, so I didn't know what anything. Fourteen. Thirteen. 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 Well, last time I went to the Holocaust Museum, I was like, I don't know. Just take a minute and then we'll get started. Just think about what you already know or what you already think you know. You had me for world history. You know that we got to world history during COVID, so or we got to uh, we got to World War II during COVID. So I didn't learn anything. Oh, not we sure were not. I believe I did. Not. Read not. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The you story. read not the book. Not. Did you not get to? No, not in class. No, no in English. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think So that means three books. Three books. But I thought you. What's your last weasel? Marsha's daughter. I thought you meant you were going to let your class read that book too. No, it wouldn't be a bad idea. It just. Uh, oh, Rachel. 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 Yes. That book is so good. It did make me cry. What made you go? Not the book. Did you. The book sucked. No, what made me mad was we watched like the Oprah special and she made him go back. I was like, oh. Now the yeah, she she really had the audacity to say, hey, let's go back to like the most traumatic experience anything you can make ever had. That was so like, like, that was like, that was like, that was like, 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 do you know that? What? Are you like, was 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 like, <sighs> wait, 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 w
at this point, you should have written down some things that you already knew um, or that you thought you already knew, and we'll see uh, how they stand up. So this is just, this first slide is just kind of a setup for what's going on around the world at this point in about 1939, 1940, where we kind of leave off talking about the Great Depression and move towards talking about World War II. So by 1939, most of the war, world was already at war. Uh, in Asia, China and Japan had been at war for seven long years with many millions already dead. Uh, Spain had only recently ended a bloody civil war with the nationalist dictator General Franco coming out on top, um, which there had actually been some Americans that had fought in the uh, Spanish Civil War um, in 1935. They, they had volunteered uh, freely and went and fought on the side of basically proto-communist. Uh, you basically had like you had Stalin on one side supporting a group of communists who had come to power. And then on the other side, you had Hitler and Mussolini supporting a group of nationalists led by General Franco. Um, so it really wasn't a great situation for a lot of uh, Spaniards to be in, um, to be kind of caught in between you know, communists on one side and nationalists on the other. Um, Italy had invaded Albania in a place called Eritrea, which is just a fancy word for saying Ethiopia, um, or you could say uh, Abyssinia. It's just, it's part of Africa. Don't worry about it. Um, Germany had annexed Austria, uh, the Anschluss, and the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia, which is just like an area that surrounds the country of Czechoslovakia um, that had been on the border with Germany. A bunch of ethnic Germans had lived there. Uh, Hitler wanted to annex it. Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, flies over to... Um, meet with Hitler and comes away with the Munich Agreement, which he said was peace in our time, that Hitler wasn't going to uh, make any more aggressive actions after he took the state and land, that this was all he was after. Uh, of course, that was completely wrong and uh, foolishly misguided by uh, Prime Minister Chamberlain. But um, then after that, Germany had actually signed a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union, which really shocked the world at the time that it happened, because Germany and the Soviet Union were like enemies. Like they, like they, like Hitler had talked about the need for Germany to create the Lebensraum, which was elbow space, um, by basically conquering places like the Ukraine and parts of the Soviet Union, and basically it was always attacking communism. So whenever the Soviet Union and Germany signed this non-aggression pact, the world was completely shocked that this happened. Um, and then in 1939, in September 1939, Germany and the Soviet Union both at the same time invaded Poland. The poor Poles um, got absolutely destroyed in about a month. But um, the invasion of Poland actually prompted Great Britain and France to declare war on Germany, although it would set up what would be called the phony war because for about six to eight months there actually wasn't really any fighting between the British and uh, or the British and French and Germany. They just kind of had a standoff for a while before the Germany or Germany finally did go ahead and invade uh, France, which would not last very long either, as anybody who watched Dunkirk would know. So you watched it? I watched it for the plot that was Hair Tales. Yeah. I did watch it for Harry. I mean, I've seen it. I watched it in theaters. And, uh, it was, did you love Harry? What if we were in the same movie? movie. I, just didn't know you. I just liked the movie. I watched it for my mom. So, in the United States, at home, uh, following World War One and the rejection of the Treaty of Versailles, the U.S. entered an era of isolationism. Uh, isolationism just meaning that basically the United States tried to stay out of world affairs, at least diplomatically. Uh, FDR had embarked on a good neighbor policy, which is uh, kind of ironic because we were not good neighbors um, to most of Central and South America. Um, but um, it, did, it did allow um, Cuba, we ended our protector to Cuba and a couple other nations. Um, so it's called the good neighbor policy. Uh, but the U.S. had also passed a, a series of neutrality acts in the 1930s to prevent the U.S. from taking sides in any war that was about to happen. So whenever France and Great Britain and Germany go to war in 1939, the U.S. really can't do much because 
of all these neutrality acts that Congress had passed uh, in the in the couple of years leading up to uh, World War II. Um, this didn't stop U.S. companies from basically selling products to both sides, uh, and in fact, companies like Ford and John Deere sold a lot of goods to the, the Germans and the Soviet Union um, before World War II. In fact, if you look at if you look on the, the screen, you have Henry Ford here. Which one? Uh, he is in the middle on this picture. He is receiving the highest the highest uh, award that can be bestowed to a foreigner by the Nazis, uh, by Nazi Germany. This is before World War II, this is before 1939, but still, um, Henry Ford was a pretty vocal supporter of, of, of Nazism um, prior to World War II. Um, and then in the bottom picture here, you actually have a John Deere tractor, and those are Russian peasants in the, the foreground because both companies, Huh. Both companies really uh, weathered the Great Depression by actually taking their goods abroad and selling them in Germany and the Soviet Union. Uh, but the Neutrality Acts limited the ability of the United States to support China in their fight with the Japanese and allowed U.S. businesses to continue to provide oil and other materials to the Japanese throughout the 1930s. So while the Japanese were actively basically taking over as much of Asia as they could possibly. The United States is actually selling them oil and material to allow them to do that, while also uh, supporting the, um, the Chinese at the same time. So basically the U.S. was trying to get rich as it possibly could by selling goods to both sides during the course of uh, the early days of World War II. But that wouldn't last for very long. So. Um, FDR and the end of neutrality. From the early days, FDR had favored ending neutrality and joining the U.S. allies, Great Britain and France. Even from, um, you know, he, he starts to get intelligence, brief, intelligence briefings on what's going on in Germany. Uh, he's especially against what the Japanese are doing in Asia. But like we said, but they have these neutrality acts and it kind of prevents the U.S. from taking a lot of actions. Um, in 1940, he is able to introduce a cash and carry policy with the Allied powers. So after World War II officially breaks out, um, they start implementing this cash and carry policy, which basically means that the British, when they um, actually are able to pay cash for uh, materials, and as long as they can come and get it themselves also, then they can take it with them. Um, but it, it's kind of the first action, is seen as the first action that the U.S. starts to take to try to break their neutrality. Um, in late 1940, uh, the U.S. actually negotiates another deal with Great Britain called Destroyers for Bases, and I would make sure that you wrote that down somewhere if you didn't already know it, because I guarantee you there would probably be a question about the Destroyers for Base or Destroyers for Bases agreement with Great Britain. Basically, what that meant was the U.S. would provide naval destroyers or navy ships, navy warships in exchange for uh, British, um, basically uh, naval bases that they had in the Pacific. Uh, I think up upwards of about 50 different bases, maybe not 50 bases, maybe it's 50 warships, either way. Basically they exchange, we exchange ships in exchange for um, getting um, a couple of new naval bases in the Pacific Ocean. So we got ships. No, we got bases. The British got ships. The destroyers for ships. So we gave the or, or the destroyers for bases. We gave the we gave them ships, and we got naval bases. Um, in early 1941, FDR got the Lend-Lease deal through Congress, which provided war material to China and Great Britain. That's another one, Lend-Lease is one you absolutely need to know. Um, that whenever uh, he gets Lynn Lee's passed, uh, basically he goes to, you know, he's, he's, he's still doing fireside chats. It's 1941. You remember the fireside chats that we talked about with the Great Depression. He goes to the American people and says that the United States needs to become the arsenal for democracy. 
um, and that with all these wars raging, that uh, the U.S. is going to start providing material to the, to the Chinese and to the British. That by 1941, when this happens, Germany has, has invaded France and basically conquered France within about a month. Um, so that hasn't been very, very long ago that that's happened. And that really kind of shocks the American people into thinking that all of a sudden, you know, we've got to take the German threat seriously, that all, all those people who were kind of pro-Germany for a while were kind of pro-Hiller because they liked some of the things he was doing economically. All of a sudden they're like, well, this guy might actually not be as good as we thought. Uh, um, huh? I said that about Hitler. Yeah, there were there were people who were pretty, uh, or not really. I wouldn't say they were really loud about their support for Hitler, but they did kind of believe in some of the things he was doing and thought that you know economically he was you know doing a lot of really nice things, and he kind of pulled Germany out of out of their Great Depression that they had before even the Great Depression started. Um, there's even a famous Nazi rally that gets held in Madison Square Garden. You can go and look at pictures. There's um, uh, there was like 20,000 plus people there in Madison Square Garden. Um, and you got the, the Nazi flags and everything, and that was in the late 1930s. So, I mean, there, the, there had been a lot of support for Hitler, but after he conquers France, people started to kind of change their tune on the way that they felt about, um, about Hitler. So, when... Um, after Lend Lease gets passed, and FDR goes to the American people and says that the United States needs to become the arsenal for democracy, he lays out his vision uh, for what the U.S. needs to do by saying that the U.S. needed to protect what he called the four freedoms. Um, and I don't know if you all know who Norman Rockwell is, but he commissioned Norman Rockwell, the painter, to paint these paintings. Have you ever heard of Norman Rockwell's album called Norman Rockwell? No, I have oh, You should listen because it's about history. Uh, I, probably, I probably should. What was you going to say, X? I was wondering about another time this pony did, but I can't remember what it was. No. He has several. He did. He does. There's a. Well, he does. He did. He does a painting in the civil rights era with the little girl who's going to school. Did he do one where it's the two barbers standing there? Like the the, the old woman, the, the old the man and woman. Yeah. No, I don't think that's a Norman Rockwell. Dang, what's no. that? I know. I know. Hold on. What's that? I know the painting you're talking about. I don't think that's a. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, hang on. I think it's this. Wait, this is the song. Grammarly can help you. Oh, sorry. This way. Oh, it's that one. This one? Yeah. This one's the one you've seen before? Yeah. I can't. We did. I, I see the one that you're talking about with the little girl. We had to do this assignment for like one of my other classes. All right. Let's, 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 let's give me that and I'll listen to it later. Can we listen to this? Later. No, just. It's six seconds. It's Millie Bobby Brown. <laughs> no. Oh, so, I think I have it too. So, the four freedoms. The four freedoms are the freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. So these weren't necessarily just like freedoms that were included in the, you know, in the Bill of Rights. These are freedoms that include, you know, freedom from want, so that people should be able to have, you know, things that they need, um, and freedom from fear, so that people don't have to be afraid. All the time, and, and I make sure that you knew the four freedoms because I you know, again talk about test questions. This is something that will probably you'll probably see again as a test question. Four freedoms: freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Which part? Which part? Freedom from freedom fear. Freedom from want. What does that even mean? That means that you should. The, Want means that you don't have all the things that you need. So, um, you know, you're you're going hungry. You're having to sacrifice. Oh. So basically, oh, you're saying that people shouldn't have to. Yeah, they don't have to worry about. Even though when the war starts, there's going to be huge rationing efforts, like um, way even more. When we get that, I'm sorry, but how did people not see this coming before it came? It's so. Cool. That is uh, always a good question. It's so. Uh, I feel like. 
it was so clear, yet they were just choosing to ignore it until it was like quite literally a global problem. Well, we have to understand that the people at the time had lived through World War One, which up until that point had been the worst war that had ever happened in human history. And so people were willing to do whatever it took to avoid having that happen again, although now it looks kind of foolish some of the efforts they took to try to make sure that didn't happen. All right, you guys ready? Yes, to go home. I want to go to Florida. So, entering the war. Uh, on June 22, 1941, Germany ended its pact with the Soviet Union and launched the largest invasion the world had ever, had ever seen called Operation Barbosa. Um, and shortly after that, the U.S. decided to include the Soviet Union in the Lend-Lease policy. So now the U.S. is, is helping the Soviet Union as well as the Chinese and the British. Uh, in July 1941, after the Japanese occupied French Indochina, which think of like where Vietnam is on the map, um, FDR cut off the sale of oil to Japan. Um, and this is really going to be the kind of the thing that kind of ends the relationship between uh, Japan and the United States. Actually, the U.S. went further than just cutting off the sale of oil. They actually froze all Japanese assets in the United States. So if you were a Japanese businessman and you had money in the United States, you couldn't get that money out anymore because the, the U.S. government froze it. Um, this severely hurt the Japanese war effort and the Japanese decided that action was required. Um, it's hard to... I, there's a podcast that Dan Carlin does um, and called Hardcore History, and he, he's doing a series right now, actually, about the U.S., or not about the U.S., but the Japanese and World War II. And I can't remember how much exactly it was that, how much oil that the Japanese were using every single day um, of the war, but it's, like, astronomical. It's, it's hard to even get your mind around just how much oil that, the, like, the naval fleet of the Japanese was burning every single day. But either way, um, the Japanese knew that they were not going to be able to sustain their war effort without the oil that the United States was providing. So they believed that if they if they made one big splash and knocked out the American Navy in one you know one quick blow, that the U.S. would basically just give up. That they would decide to go ahead and sue for peace um, and kind of change their policy position on selling oil to the Japanese and just basically this would just kind of neutralize the threat of the Americans. Um, so on the morning of December 7th, 1941, the Japanese were actually supposed to deliver a message to FDR like 30 minutes before this happened, telling him what that the Japanese were going to declare war on the United States just to kind of give him like a 30 minute heads up. Somehow or another, the, the wires get crossed. They don't actually deliver the message until 30 minutes after the de or after uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor starts. So a lot of people are going to be upset about that for whatever reason, because either way, there's plenty to be upset about. Um, you know, it would have been difficult for FDR to have alerted everybody in 30 minutes that war was imminent with the Japanese. But either way, um, on the morning of December 7th, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Um, and there's a lot of conspiracies that go along with this bombing. There's a conspiracy that FDR knew that this was going to happen. Um, at the time, um, at this point in, in world history, the naval battleships that had been so important up to this point were no longer very important. That really what was important were aircraft carriers. And some people knew that, and some people didn't really know that yet. A lot of people thought FDR did, because none of the aircraft carriers were actually at Pearl Harbor that day. So that kind of helps with some of the conspiracy theories that people are like, hey, I think FDR knew, because none of these, none of the aircraft carriers were Pearl Harbor, so none of them got sunk or destroyed. Um, also, um, the, the uh, Air Force, which really wasn't the Air Force at the time, but the, the airplanes, a lot of people were worried about um, sabotage, which is basically like somebody going and like, you know, messing with some of the planes individually, like you know, like taking a starter out of one or something, or, or you know, siphoning out all the, the gas or oil in one. 
So they actually had lined all the planes up tip to tip, like like wing tip to wing tip. So when the Japanese you know came over, they were able to just kind of destroy all of them. Um, either way, it was very devastating. There was something like 5,000 Americans killed um, over the course of the, the Battle of Pearl Harbor. Um, and, of course, the next thing you know, um, December 8th, FDR starts with his fireside chat to the American people uh, and his address to Congress saying that, uh, you know, December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy. Um, and then the next day, the United States is at war with Japan. And soon after, there'll be a war with uh, Germany also. A little side note, whenever uh, Hitler declared war on the United States, um, some of his military planners who have, were trying to estimate how much the United, how much material the United States could produce, were reading aloud like how much that they estimated that the U.S. would produce uh, when it came to uh, you know like ships and tanks and, and planes and all that. I'm sorry. Kill him this morning. Um, and. Hitler and his and his uh, leadership just laughed because the the numbers were so high that they thought it was just kind of silly that they, they were even talking about it and that it was impossible that the U.S. could do that. And actually, those estimates ended up being lower. Uh, the United States actually outproduced even what the Germans thought they could produce. Uh, just war guns, material, tanks, bombs. guns, tanks, bombs, yeah, planes. So, uh, immediately following the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the Japanese launched an invasion of the Philippines, uh, which had a pretty large American base there already. There was something like about 20 to 30,000 American soldiers who were already stationed in the Philippines because the United States had gotten the Philippines. If you remember back to the U.S. Uh, Spanish-American War, when we got the Philippines as a result of beating the Spanish, so there's already a base there. Uh, the Philippines immediately... Uh, come under attack from the Japanese after Pearl Harbor on the same day, actually. Um, and it ends up resulting in the capture of all the American forces there, as well as about 50,000 uh, Filipino forces. Uh, and there will actually be a really terrible march that happens at, at the end of, of that fighting called the Bataan Death March, um, where basically they'll be forced to walk several hundred miles in brutal conditions um, and a lot of people will be killed. There will be, there will be some Americans who actually will be imprisoned um, following the Bataan Death March all the way until the end of the war. Um, and there, there actually is some, uh, there's one of the guys that's actually in um, the Ken Burns documentary on World War II. And it's pretty terrifying, some of the things he had to go through. Um, the Japanese aggression in the Pacific was finally halted at Midway Island, where the Japanese were defeated. There's actually a movie that just came out recently called The Battle of Midway, which was actually a remake of an old movie called The Battle of Midway. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they updated it with new special effects and all that. Um, American forces began an island hopping strategy that would take them through famous battles at places like Wattle Canal, Saipan, Peleliu, Iwo Jima, and finally Okinawa. Um, but fighting in the Pacific was really different than fighting in Europe. Um, and you can usually tell where a soldier had been fighting by just looking at them. If they looked like they were starving, uh, if they looked dirty and, and covered in black soot, then most likely they had been fighting in Japan. Or not fighting in Japan, but fighting in the Pacific. Uh, the Pacific War was extremely brutal and really terrible in a lot of ways. And we'll look at a couple of first-hand accounts from soldiers who fought in the Pacific. Uh, because if you know me, I'm, I'm a sucker for a glutton for punishment when it comes to just, you know, really terrible things for whatever reason. So. Why didn't you join the Army? That's a good question. I don't know. So, North Africa and Italy, so shifting gears to uh, the other hemisphere. Uh, FDR and Winston Churchill, who was the Prime Minister of England at the time, uh, knew their forces would not yet be ready to launch an invasion of Europe, despite the wishes of Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin wanted the United States and Great Britain to open another uh, front in Europe to kind of take the pressure off the Soviet Union. 
but the British and the Americans were not ready for that yet. Um, they remembered what happened to Dunkirk, which again I brought, dropped in Dunkirk, um, and they didn't want to launch another invasion and then be stuck in another place like Dunkirk and maybe not get as lucky as the British did at Dunkirk uh, the next time. Um, so after, um, so they, they decided to open up a front in North Africa, which is where uh, the Germans and Italians had been. That was the new front. Uh, the Germans and Italians had been conquering much of, of Northern Africa up until that point. The Americans and British decided to fight back. Um, and after a couple months, they do finally defeat the Axis forces there. Uh, once they force the Axis uh, forces to withdraw from Africa, they invade uh, Sicily and decide to kind of move up the Italian peninsula. Um, Led by British Field Marshal Montgomery and American General Patton, they had actually a pretty famous rivalry trying to outdo each other. Um, until Patton actually gets in trouble for slapping a soldier um, in a military hospital. Oh, I'm um, because well, it's a, a soldier had been experiencing PTSD, but they didn't know what to call it at the time, and Patton just thought it was kind of cowardice and. He was talking to a soldier and he actually just slaps him. And it's a, huh? They just, they just so he actually he actually gets demoted, but uh, they kind of keep it quiet for a long time. Uh, anyway, he actually does get back into command and he'll he'll play a big role in the Battle of the Bulge later. Um, following the successful invasion of Sicily, Allied forces invaded Italy, uh, forcing the Italian government to get out of the war. Um, though German forces continued the war effort and Mussolini was evacuated in order to remain the puppet leader of Italy until closer to the end of the war. So they, the Italian gov government actually tries to sue for peace and get out of the war whenever they get invaded. Uh, they depose Mussolini and Hitler actually has him flown out secretly um, and he maintains like puppet leader of Italy status until closer to the end of the war when the Italian population will actually get their hands on him and basically brutally murder him in the street and tie him up. Um, yes. Which actually does happen. It's a real literal thing to happen. So finally, um, while while the invasion of Italy is still happening, they're actually still fighting in Italy when D-Day happened. They'll be fighting in Italy all the way until the end of the war, really. Um, but on June 6, 1944, after months of preparation, the Allies finally launched their uh, long-planned invasion of France on the coast of Normandy. Uh, over 150,000 troops landed on the beaches of Normandy and parachuted uh, on land as the Allies battled to establish a beachhead on the continent. Um, Operation Overlord, D-Day, whatever you want to call it. Um, over 10,000 Allied soldiers would be killed. Uh, through the, the multiple uh, day battle, it, it takes about 20 or so days to finally really establish the, the beachhead that they needed to start really bringing in goods and materials. Um, but that happens on June 6, 1944. Make sure you remember that date. June 6, 1944. Oh. All right, so the war in Europe. In 1943, the Soviet Union finally blocked the German advance in Stalingrad and began pushing the Germans back. That's really pretty much the end of the Germans uh, as far as being a serious contender for winning the war, really, from this point on. From the end of Stalingrad on, it's pretty much just a long slog back, but there's never really any chance that the Germans are going to win. Um, they're always going to lose from that point on. That's kind of what makes World War II different than World War I, because World War I, in 1918, the Germans still have a good chance of winning. Um, but in World War II, really, they don't have any chance of winning from 1943 on. Now, the war could have gone on for longer if the Americans and British hadn't invaded um, you know, on D-Day, but ultimately, the oh, Soviet okay. Union was, was really kicking German butt all the way up until, really all the way up until D-Day. Um, 
So uh, following D-Day, the Allies began pushing the Germans out of France, officially liberating Paris on August 25th, 1944. So finally, Paris had been liberated after having been having spent four years uh, under German control. Uh, the Allies attempted to go around German defenses by launching an airborne invasion into the, ne into the Netherlands called Operation Market Garden in September 1944. Uh, but it goes really terribly. It's actually completely airborne. Um, all paratroopers, um, and they don't really have tanks and some other things. And they think they're going to be going against like old men and young kids. And German troops are really what they, they end up going against is, is one of the most elite German units that were left in the war. So it doesn't, it ends up going very poorly for them. Um, but they continue pushing, uh, eastward anyway. Uh, the Germans launched their last offensive of the war called the Battle of the Bulge on December 16th, 1944. Um, and this will go on for about a month. If anybody's seen A Band of Brothers, the HBO series, uh, they talk plenty about the Battle of the Bulge because the 101st Airborne gets surrounded in a place called Bastogne. Um, and they spend, actually the German officer actually sends a note to the, the leader of the 101st Airborne asking him to surrender. Um, and the, the commander famously gives a one word response. He sends it back and it just says nuts um, with exclamation points and it gets read out to all the, the soldiers nuts. and they all get it's nuts. Yeah. What does that mean? This means like crazy. Like they're not going to do that. Like no, they're not going to surrender. If there what was, is, what world is world the, the movie that's like about like the. Decoding the stuff. What is that what you call it? Stop working. The decoding stuff? Like the, like the messaging and like. What is it called? Uh, is that the movie with Benedict Cumberbatch? Oh, Benedict. Isn't it? I bet you that's why I'm going to watch it again. Yeah, he, he's in one of them. I know, I know one of the movies you're talking about. There's actually a couple of movies about it. I can't remember. The specific one you're talking about, but I know. The imitation game. The imitation game, yeah. If we were in the World War right now, do you think we'd have school? No. They did. I mean, the, the United States, we had school. Not in person school. Oh, they, 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 they had in person they school. school. You couldn't really have a war like they had now. They would, everybody just knew each other. It wouldn't. That would be the concern, Casey. That would be the concern. <laughs> Like, there would be no oh, okay. <laughs> So, after the Battle of the Bulge gets broken, the, the U.S. and the Soviet Union start actually invading into Germany. Um, as Allied forces started pushing into Germany, they, be, they, started, becoming, they started coming across uh, Jewish comp concentration camps and finding evidence of the Holocaust that had been long rumored. Now, there had been rumors that this stuff was happening in Germany at the time, but the Germans didn't let that information out. A lot of people weren't 100% sure it was happening. Uh, it was actually a very famous incident where a bunch of German refugees, uh, Jewish refugees, try to enter the United States. But you remember those, those quota systems we talked about for immigration? Um, There's actually a, a steam powered ship that brought over a couple thousand um, Jewish immigrants from Germany, and the U.S. didn't let them in. Um, it was called the St. Louis, and they actually sent them back to Germany, and a bunch of them uh, passed away during in the, the Holocaust. Um, the 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 Russians had started finding concentration camps in 1944. They didn't really let that information out because they're Russians, and for whatever reason, you know, it really wasn't that great for a, a Jewish prisoner in a concentration camp to be discovered by the Russian army because the Soviets didn't really like Jewish people either. Um, Although they would have still been better off than being in, in an actual literal concentration camp. But either way, um, the Americans come across their first real concentration camp um, on August, on April the 11th, 1945, when they come across Buchenwald. Um, Hitler, after the invasion of D-Day, Hitler started to pull a lot of the concentration camps back into further into Germany. So that's the reason why the, the, the U.S. doesn't actually come across one until April the 11th. Um, then on April 29th, they liberate the camp at Dachau, which is one of the most famous ones. Um, up there with Auschwitz, I'd say Buchenwald and Dachau are probably the, the three most famous ones. 
Um, finally, um, you know, in, in all, more than six million Jews would be discovered to have been killed during the course of the Holocaust. Uh, Adolf Hitler would commit suicide on April 30th, 1945. And Germany would officially surrender on May the 8th, 1945. So there was there was actually fighting for a whole week after Hitler had been killed. Although for the most part, the only reason that there's even that week is that there were some negotiations on how the surrender would have to happen. So, so on May the 8th, 1945, uh, that is what is called VE Day, or Victory in Europe Day. That's not the end of World War II. Um, the Pacific War is still going on. There's actually still a lot of fighting happening in Okinawa at the time. Um, there's actually this. It, uh, there's actually this point system that, depending on how long you had been served or how long you'd been serving, if you had enough points, if you had fought in Europe and you were in Germany at the time, there was a lot of belief that you were probably going to be sent to Japan or, or to fight the Japanese. Um, but if you had enough points, then you could you could go home. You could be relieved. Of you, know, you, could, you could be discharged honorably and you can go home. But a lot of soldiers were planning on having to go and fight in Japan. So that brings us to the Manhattan Project. Um, throughout the course of the war, the U.S. had embarked on a secret project to develop an atomic weapon known as the Manhattan Project. Uh, following the invasion of Okinawa, military planners believed that a mainland invasion of Japan would result in around 250,000 American casualties. Not to include uh, at least another 250,000 Japanese civilian casualties, not to include the, the Japanese military casualties. Um, basically, they believed that there would be over a million casualties if the U.S. actually invaded Japan. So ever since this event happened, there's been a lot of debate about whether or not it was necessary for the U.S. to drop atomic weapons on uh, Japan, and there's actually you know good arguments on both sides. It's kind of it's kind of tough for me to really pick a, a side. You know, on one side, atomic it's weapons are terrible, and a lot of people get brutally killed for no reason. But if the U.S. had had to invade Japan, you know how much worse could that have been? Like it's it's impossible to tell. Um, so it was decided that the nuclear bombs would be dropped on Japan rather than the U.S. completing an invasion of Japan. So on August 6, 1945, uh, the first bomb would be dropped on Hiroshima, um, or Hiroshima, however you say it, Hiroshima, Hiroshima. Hiroshima. I've heard, I've heard it pronounced both ways. It's just one of those, one of those deals. Um, and then the second bomb will be dropped on August the 9th, 1945, after which the Japanese decided to give up. Um, over 400,000 Japanese civilians would end up dead as a result of the dropping of the atomic bomb. Not all of them instantly. A lot of them would die later as, as a result of radiation poisoning uh, and different cancers that formed as a result of radiation exposure. Um, but on August the 14th, 1945, Japan officially surrendered, known as VJ Day, or Victory in Japan Day. That is the official end of World War II. So FDR would not see the end of World War II as he passed away in April of 1945, uh, leaving Harry, Pres Harry Truman as president. Harry, Pre Harry Truman. Oh, 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 oh. Harry Truman. Yeah, he's the guy that actually gives the go-ahead to drop the atomic weapon for the atomic bombs. Not ever. Um, over 400,000 Americans would become casualties during World War II. Uh, some 120,000 passed away, and at least uh, 280,000 uh, would be severely injured during the course of the war. Over six million Jews would be exterminated in Nazi German or Nazi uh, concentration camps, and in all, 50 million people worldwide would become casualties. Um, which is a lot of people. And roughly at least 40% of the people who passed away would be uh, civilians. So you're talking about 20 million or so uh, civilian casualties, about 30 million military casualties. Uh, most of the people who, who died in World War II died on the Eastern Front um, in the fighting between Germany and, and Soviet Union. 
Uh, in fact, I've seen a statistic that nine out of every 10 German soldiers who died, died fighting the Russians. Um, and just really what was absolutely brutal warfare. I don't know if anybody's ever seen uh, Stalingrad or, or, or uh, seen the movie Enemy at the Gates. That's a good movie about Stalingrad. But uh, the fighting on the Eastern Front was um, vicious. Uh, basically, neither side took prisoners. Um, and they killed a lot of civilians too. Uh, following the end of the war, the Soviet Union and the United States began breaking up much of the world into their own spheres of influence, setting the stage for the Cold War. So almost immediately after the war was over, uh, the Cold War is going to begin. So two, two countries that had been on the same side as each other or with each other during the war immediately kind of turn against each other uh, once all the dust settles from World War II. And actually, a lot of people think the reason that Harry Truman had dropped the atomic bombs um, in Japan at all was to send a message to the, the Russians that they had nuclear weapons and that, that should maybe stop the Soviet Union from trying to gobble up too much territory um, following the war. Um, actually, the U.S. and um, the U.S. and, and uh, the Soviet Union will split up Germany between themselves, They'll split it up into East and West Germany, uh, with East Germany falling uh, under the, um, into the Iron Curtain, basically being taken over by the Soviet Union, um, and West Germany would be you know, kind of democratic and, and more like the rest of Western Europe. But we'll get more into that later on. So, any questions about World War II? Comments, concerns? Can we watch clips? Can we huh? do this now? Can we watch clips of it sometime today? Natalie has a song for you. Oh, yeah. Go ahead and play your song. We've only, like, only got like five minutes, so we don't have time to start the crash for a second. Charts. There's another one. <laughs> <laughs> 